Yeah. Let me know when we're going. Okay. Like these settings, just a little bit of back. Almost there, yeah, one second. One second, I'll pay you one second out of me. What made you come through there? Uh oh, let's go. <laughs> Come on, Facebook. I'm tagging you in this now, Drew. I won't say it. Okay. All right, go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome to the discussion, episode 11. 
discussing black women empowerment. Got my host, obviously, Gerard Lindsay. Hey, Gerard, let me unmute you there. What's going on, Ma? Yes, and we have a very special guest, Alandis Powell. Please introduce yourself. Hey, hi, I'm Alandis Powell. So I, I, I wanted to take a moment, right, because I felt she would do that and be very, very modest with the introduction, as she should be, as she is. Um, we have Alandis Powell, who is the YWCA Cincinnati Career Achievement Award recipient, a Greater Cincinnati Foundation Woman of the Year, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, Urban League Board Chair, ISO VP of Business Controls at a Fortune 500 bank locally, right? Um, and also the woman who initiated and spearheaded the Black Lives Matter mural in Cincinnati um, that was, if I'm not mistaken, right? inspired by her poem we want what you want is that accurate yes sir all right great great so we are blessed we are honored we have an activist on our hand we have a, a corporate leader on our hand um so so we're going to get into it um there was this quote and it always intrigued me um by malcolm x the most disrespected woman in america is the black woman the most unprotected person in america is the black woman the most neglected person in America is the black woman. So with that being said, you have managed to ascend through the ranks in leadership from a corporate perspective and a nonprofit perspective. What I wanna know from you is, do you feel like that ho quote holds true? And also, how did you manage to ascend and continue to grow within the businesses and profit organizations that you work with? Um. I think the the statement holds true in so many regards and the data actually proves it. But I think when you have um, a huge compassion, when you have this resolve to get things done, when you've been raised by great a great black man, mm -hmm. when you've been surrounded by great black men, mm -hmm. that it can change that definition of us. Actually, it allows us to change how we define ourselves. I have this thing that black men are supposed to rule the world. Mm. And that, um, that perspective, I think, makes me like linger on most black men's words. And, and it gives you the will to keep fighting for what's right. So I do believe that's true in so many regards. But, but I do think we have the ability to change it with our compassion and our resolve. It's interesting that you say you have this thing that most black men or that black men should rule the world. Um, I know you, I know uh, your sons, right? And I know how you want to empower them. Uh, I want to jump right into your, your social activism, right? Uh, can you tell me a little bit, like with everything that's going on racially in, in this environment, how you've been, how it's impacted you internally? Has it ignited another fire? Cause you've been socially active, but has this ignited another fire and gave you another gear? Um, I think I've always been like, you know, always been a fighter for equality mm -hmm. and equal rights. And I'll fight for people that don't even know they need fighting for. And I don't mind going up against the big folks that most people don't go up against. So that hasn't changed. I think what, what has changed is, my desire to want to capitalize on this moment mm -hmm. to actually make us turn the corner for ourselves right so we can turn the corner and and also so people look at us differently because when people start looking at us differently then our kids start acting differently mm -hmm. when people start seeing the greatness in us then we start seeing the greatness in us and um that's what i want to use this time to do it's not changed it's just a resolve and, and a and a more heightened awareness of making it happen. How are you switching that conversation? So people, when you say people start looking at us differently, what does that look like and how has that come about? Um, so I'll take Black Lives Matter. Right. Um, I wanted to say it without, I wanted to say it loud and that's why we put an exclamation point in it that no one else had done. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I wanted it to explain it. And so you didn't feel like we were just yelling it in your face. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we stop and we tell our stories and we tell our whys, then we change the hearts and minds of people. Because I don't think we can change things unless we change people's hearts and we change people's minds. 
change our minds about how we see ourselves and change the minds of how people see us. So that's pretty much what it's been about for me is how do you have those conversations? I used to be extremely militant. You know, I mean militant. And I, and I realized that to change things, I had to figure out a different approach. And that was years and years and years ago. And um, so people would hear you because if you're yelling, you know, when you're yelling with your spouse or whatever, y'all don't hear each other. It's not until you're calm and you're actually just telling your why that people listen to you. So that's what I've been trying to do. Take two steps back and just allow you to hear, hear me. So that's what's been a little different. Okay. Okay. And so have you seen things change within your own organization as far as the corporation that you work for? Yeah, I think I've seen things change a lot of places in corporations, um, people reach out, you know, we talk through how you do things differently. The desire to actually figure out why we've allowed this to go on so long. And then the desire to change it. What I worry about is that we are a people of sound bites mm. and that as quickly as things come, they can go. Yeah. So the question is, is how do we sustain it? How do we remain relevant? And how do we hold people accountable to what their mouth is saying? So I've seen a lot, I've seen, I've heard a lot. I think people want to change. I pe think people have the right heart. Um, you can't keep going backwards and say, why did you do it? Because then people like get embarrassed and you can't drive them forward. It's like, I don't want to judge your intent. I don't know why you did this stuff. Mm -hmm. I just want you to change what you're doing. You said you've seen, I remember there's something that I read. Um, it was a quote by you uh, it, and I'm paraphrasing. I, I, I hear what you say, um, I, I see what you write, but I also see what you don't do, right? So I'm paraphrasing, and, and I guess when we, we speak about sustainability, how, how do we manage that? How do we make sure that we're holding people accountable, Any, even ourselves, right? Yeah, so I think you have to change policies. You have to mm -hmm. change what we write in ink, right? You have to say that when things aren't the way they should be, you're going to hold people accountable. So if you decide, I want to change the makeup of my organization to have 20 or 30 percent blacks in every level, you're going to base that on your community. So right now, people don't know. Cincinnati is made up of 47 percent blacks. Mm -hmm. Hamilton County is made up of 28 percent blacks. So with those numbers, what we should say is in every organization at every level, not just entry level, we should be represented at those numbers. So if you hold yourself accountable to that and you write it down and you actually put it in front of people to say, this is how you get your bonus. This is how you make your living by meeting these numbers. People will start meeting it. And then when you say, when you lose black talent, you have to be able to sit down and, and be accountable to why, because you still have to have the right environment for all people to succeed. So all of that plays a role. So I do think you change it, you sustain it, but you sustain it to, through policies, what you write down and promise yourself as an organization. Do you feel like that that will encourage an environment where people are spiteful towards Black people? Oh, we, we have to meet a quota, where it's just a, a quota game, right? Where it's not really them empowering Black people or even developing the Black people. We need this many people, this many Black people in this position, we're just gonna hire there. Do you think that's what, or is, is, are you concerned that that's one of the things that may happen? Yeah. No. And, and might I add, might I add, you know, and I think Gerard speak the term I think you're uh, speaking to is tokenism, you know. Um, yeah. Or affirmative, you know, affirmative action. Affirmative action, yeah. right. Affirmative a yeah, so no, I think that's where we come in. Mm -hmm. So if we know that we have to work harder, if we know we have to bring it, then we have to teach our kids and teach ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to bringing it. So when we get opportunities, we have to hold them dear and do what we need to do. We need to get good mentors, good people around us, make sure we do our job. So if we open the door for you to have an opportunity, I suggest you do well with it. That's it. That's, that's what takes that away from people. It's when we don't show up. So we have to show up and show out for that not to be the case. And if they want to assume that's the case right now, get over it. Okay, so what? That's called equity. So right now, we're starting behind the curve. So you might have to do a little extra. But I'll tell you, it's a whole lot of people don't look like us that don't do their jobs and they get to keep it, right? That's tokenism. Absolutely. So we got to quit associating ourselves with that stuff 
and understand that's how people have been doing us forever. Exactly. We just have to do the job we're paid for and do it well and watch things grow from there. Yeah, so I got a, I got a question. Um, let me come back to that. I got to figure out how to conceptualize it. Go ahead, Gerard. Absolutely, absolutely. I like what you said about doing our job and doing it well. I, I have a concern. So again, I, I want to reiterate for anyone who, who's just joining us, uh, we have Alandis Powell who has a lot of different awards within the city. She's an activist within the city. But I saw one of the things that I, I want people to understand, this woman is a wife, a mother, a grandmother. I've had personal interactions with this woman. This is a, a miraculous woman. So her titles really, I think personally, are the lesser of who she really is. School, right? Uh, so I, I want to get your opinion on this, how the education gap is currently, right? Um, you have grandchildren. Uh, and what do you think about how the, the two days on, the three days off, and how can the Black parent who, and you are a, you, you love work-life balance. I, I need people to understand that. I've worked with you. I know how you are about work-life balance. How do you propose that people will deal with that, especially in our lower income communities? Do you have any concerns? What are your thoughts about that? How they're going to teach their children work? Um, their kids won't be going to school as much. Do you have any thoughts on that that you can share with us? Yeah, I have a huge concern. I'm not exactly sure how we uh, care for this COVID piece that's impacted us. But um, yeah, a lot of parents in our community, they don't have their high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And we're asking them to do something really big and we're already behind and, and you worry about this story you'll see the fur even further behind. So our education system already had, has failed us. It's continued to fail us. Um, we spend more time disciplining kids instead of focusing on getting them back in the classroom. Like if you're going to punish someone, make them do extra homework. Absolutely. You know, if you're going to put your goal should be to get them back in the classroom. So I, I do think that that worries me. Um, but you know, that's where prayer comes in. And that's mm -hmm. where you just really know that at the end of the day, all God is in control. And you pray over people, you help them, you be there when they need it. We have to figure out our community, how we can support each other through this. But yes, it's a concern. And I don't think anyone has figured out how to get us through this yet. Still, it's a concern. Agreed, agreed. Uh, Mo, if you if you don't have anything, I, I do have a couple more things that I want to ask. Right, go far away, buddy. All right, good. How is your business navigating COVID, Alandis? Um, so a lot of people work from home. I haven't been in the office in months. Mm. Um, some people can't work from home. Some people have to be in the office. Um, it's just really making sure that you know everything is clean. People in the office with distancing. Um being flexible with people, especially people who have uh, school age kids. And right now we're waiting to see what people need based on what Cincinnati Public Schools will be doing. So we're just trying to be there for them and make sure that uh, from an organization, we've given people what they need to get through this time. Have you had to change anything about your leadership style since COVID has hit? Have you had to yes. get any new? I'm sorry, go yes, ahead. So we've still hired, I, I hired, someone recently about to start and really figuring out how to onboard has been a little different, but you mm -hmm. probably noticed, Gerard, I, I managed and led large groups that worked from home from years. So I just always know that you have to teach people to have a cutoff point mm -hmm. so that they know to turn it off and they don't continue working 24 hours in their living room and stress their families out. Um, so have a turnout point and always say that people should transition to work. So, we uh, ride in our cars, you know, I don't know you, I listen to uh, music. I used to, when I was militant, I used to listen to Tupac on the way to work, right? And I realized that was actually, you know, making me come to work with this soul power sign on. But, um, you know, you transition from your home life to your work life. A lot of times it's through travel, through music. You have to figure out how to do that same, time, same thing in a work from home environment. Um, we celebrate people, like we're about to do a Zoom paint, uh, paint sit paint and sip here soon in the next couple of weeks and so you just try to find creative things to keep people together motivated and at the same time let people understand that work should have a stopping point what's your favorite tupac song all eyes on me, all eyes on me. i love it that's fair 
That's fair. That's more than fair. All right. Um, I want to get back to you leading as a black woman. Um, for the black women who are out there, do you have any advice, any tips? Was there any experiences where you felt as a black woman you were singled out? Just any, do you have any barriers, any challenges that you've experienced that you can share with us? Um, so, and this comment is take it in the right way, but um, I do have a problem with uh, a lot of times um, interracial relationships with white women. Sometimes mm -hmm. they feel like they have my voice because they're married to a black man, have a biracial kids, and I, res you know, I respect everyone to do them, but you can't have my voice. Like so many people try to take the good of us as black women and kind of spin it. And you can't have my voice because I never get to take it off. So mm. if, I'm a, if, if I'm a white lady in an interview, I don't have to tell you what my home life looks like until I decide to. Mm -hmm. Well, my blackness doesn't come off. I don't want it to, by the way. But sometimes having conversations like that to say, you really can't speak for me, mm -hmm. can sometimes be a little difficult because you don't want to sound like I'm not, I'm not jealous. I'm not, I just want you to understand that my experience as a black woman, you don't have it just because you're married to a black guy or have black, you still don't have my experience as a black woman. It's not something you can marry into. Mm. We are a different breed. And, and sometimes people forget that. So when that's probably, had, it's, I don't know. <laughs> when you've had those conversations, do they always, like, are you used to having them now? Are you, you more comfortable with them? I can imagine the first time was a little difficult, but are you more comfortable with it um, now? Yeah, I just know how to say it in a nice way and still, you know, maintain a great relationship because it's not personal. Yeah. But, um, you know, we we have a lot as black women. We have a lot. You know, when you look at all that we've been through, when, when you look at um, how uh, in the 90s, how uh, drugs was destroying us and our families, right? We still are suffering through that. And then when you look at mental illness and how the policies of mental illness kind of change through the crack epidemic and now it's changing back because you know we're in a different epidemic and so we're looking at it differently, we still have those scars that we go through and we're, and we're, we're fixing. And then you have this other thing. There's, um, I met Gina Davis years ago and um, she actually talked about a thing called the Jane Project she was doing. And she was able to correlate TV with real life. And if you remember CSI and all those things where uh, forensic science became the new sexy and women was in forensic science. And what people don't know is it shot up with people enroll, women enrolling in school for forensic science. So if you take that same philosophy and you look at how they portray us on TV and how they portray black women, how they portray black men, then you know what they're feeding our soul is not what we want to attain to be. And the, the best thing we had going was uh, Bill Cosby. You remember that, right? I guess you're not allowed to talk about Bill Cosby anymore, but it was the uh, only thing they had for us that actually made it look like we had something going on for a while. So I think even the media has played a part in black women and, and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish, but it's hurt us. It's hurt us. So we have a lot to do. I still, uh, I still let Lil Rod watch the Cosby Show. I think it's a great show. It um, is a great show. Blackish is my one of our new favorite shows as well. I encourage people to watch that as well. I think it portrays black people in a great light. Uh, what about music? Do you feel like black people hold any of that responsibility in the way that we're portrayed, or do you think it's solely on me media deciding what to put out? Because there are multiple images, right? Um, but mm -hmm. the media obviously has the are, are the decision makers when that goes to the public, right? So what are your thoughts on that? On music. Um, I think we have a strange way of expressing ourselves sometimes. Okay. And my son raps, you know that. Yeah. And yeah. I don't want to listen to none of it. Like, I'm like, I do not want you calling women bees. I do not want this. And I do know it is the way people express themselves. And you try mm -hmm. to just, um, you know, you try to just roll with it and understand mm -hmm. that every, everything is different. But I still think sometimes we lack principles mm. of what we should and shouldn't do. Um, but does it make or break us? I, I don't think so. Okay. 
do you feel like the differences in the way that when you say we lack principles, the, the difference in how kids are being raised, just from what your experiences and what you've mm -hmm. seen, do you think that contributes to the negative um, perception of black people, right? Or the, just the, the lack of principles, is it deteriorating our communities, do you feel like? Or how do you feel like our communities are, the state of our communities is today? What are your thoughts on that? Which question are you asking me? I guess the question <laughs> I wanna ask you first, so I, mean, I got so much to ask you, right? The first question I wanna ask you is, how are parents raising their kids different from how now, from how they raised their kids when you were growing up, right? And is that good or bad? <laughs> And so this is what I'll say. You can't generalize us like that. And that's okay. the problem that we always try to generalize us. Look at you, Gerard. You're jamming when it comes to being a daddy. I have a son that is one of the best dads I know, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and he, it wasn't like he went through life easy, you know, because he went through some times too. We all do. So For I sure. think it's hard to generalize us. And, and I think we have to quit doing that because we're different too. Mm -hmm. So you have some great black parents. You have some great white parents and you have some sorry black parents and you have some sorry white parents. So I think that we really have to quit just generalizing that and saying for the collective good. Now, the data does say that we do have some parenting issues, right? But they're generational. So we all know systemic racism exists. Mm -hmm. But what people don't talk about a lot is systemic oppression. Right, so there's systemic racism coupled with systemic oppression. And all of those can kind of like foster bad parenting, bad decisions. We all make them, bad kind of everything, right? And it's how we get out of those. It's how we decide to change our lives. And then you come out, you, you have a system that sometimes is not forgiving for us. Um, you have mothers who's trying to find the daddy you know, we have all kinds of things. And you have some people who have never gone out of a three mile radius of their neighborhoods. So they've never even seen outside their neighborhoods. But I don't think we can just generalize it. I can just say that we all have work to do. And you know what, at the end of the day, we all fall short. We all just fall short. So um, yeah, it's in pockets, but I don't Absolutely. like to generalize stuff like that. So, so, so I have a, a question. You, you referred, you said that, uh, um, this is a point. Fire away, Gerard. I got to think about this again. So I think the reason why me and, or just even in certain scenarios, I generalize us is because the black struggle is typically collective, right? So when you say systemic racism and systemic oppression, it affects all people of color. So I agree with you, right? that we do have to get, because all black people don't think alike, right? And exactly. if we do make it, I know I'm definitely guilty of making the mistake of trying to speak for the collective. Have you ever been in a position whereas you, I know you've been in rooms where you're the only black woman, right? Or it might be the only black person, right? I know mm -hmm. for a fact you've been in there. What is it like? Because don't they expect you to speak for the collective? And do you make them aware of the fact that you are, you can't speak for the collective? How do you might I, I jump in really quickly? Um, if you could, before you before you answer that, if you can also give the listeners, uh, what 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 is systemic racism? What is system, systemic oppression? Uh -huh. I mean, there, I, you know, I might assume that many people know what that is, but uh, I think there I think it's a good idea to kind of recap, just give a little, you know. Yeah. So systemic racism are just like um, things that we do and policies that we have. Sometimes they're quiet and unseen sometimes you can actually see them sometimes they're written in words that actually are plagued against a certain group of people and in this case when i say it it's about blacks mm -hmm. oppression is some of the biases that sometimes people know and don't know that oppress people and they do it on purpose or sometimes just because they've been trained to do it so think about this if you get on an elevator with a white lady and she clutches her purse we'll giggle because we know right that that might happen that's part of oppression, mm. right? Because how does it really make you feel when you go home? And so oppression can be seen and unseen. It can be felt and just something you learn to, to live with. And then the other pieces, sometimes you know how a policeman will stop you. My son, I always tell the story. My, um, 
I have a story about Demonte, my, my oldest and my youngest, but my youngest son got stopped maybe six or seven times in a five day period till I had to actually go to the police station to figure out what's up and we gonna cut it out, right? That is part of oppression. Because what happens is, is they're just gonna keep messing with you until they catch you doing stuff. And when they catch you doing stuff, all of a sudden you have something that holds you from actually sometimes it puts a roadblock in your life from doing something better. So those are things, part one is oppression and one is actually systems that we actually have in play, so, somewhat partly because of Jim Crow, so. Does that help? Yes, it does, thank you. Okay. And what was the second part? What was your question, Gerard? I'm sorry. No, you're fine, you're fine. Um, I actually wanted to follow up. If you don't mind sharing the land this, and you can be general with it, when you went to the police station, right? That's something, that's a bold move, something I wouldn't even have thought of, of doing, right? How was that interaction and did it make a difference? Um, yes, and I've done it twice. Actually, I did it not long ago because they had stopped my son and pulled everything out of his car. So I went and I actually had Fairfield go and pull all the data for that corner to mm. show me how many black kids you stopped at two in the morning, how many people did you, you know, so you can understand your own data and make some changes. But um, I, I just went in because that's what mamas do. Do you know what I'm saying? It didn't feel any kind of way. I just did it. You know, when you're trying to protect your kids, it doesn't matter. You know, you're going to a fire. So I just did it because that's what we're supposed to do. And you just requested, y'all pull the data. I want to see this. So a couple months ago when my son had gotten stopped and they actually um, brought the dogs and pulled everything out of his car and out of his trunk and um, I actually called him and didn't want to speak to anyone but the sergeant and i asked him some questions that he needed to answer and the only way to answer it was to go get the data so he had to call me back in a couple of days and he pulled all the reports and told me to answer so you know you have to ask yeah. yes. and i think sometimes people don't know that that's all we have to do is ask i appreciate that i appreciate that for sure so going back to and, and obviously we want to stick with this right if you could tell, if you could give some advice to a black man, right? Because I know you were talking about how, and I know how near and dear your father was to you, right? Um, could you give us some of the advice that he gave you, some of the principles that he's installed in you that help you become the woman that you are today? Um, Excellent, question. Excellent question. So he held me accountable to my mistakes. We weren't allowed to say that anyone was actually racist against us unless we had three facts. So you couldn't come home and say, hey, the teacher did me wrong because I'm black because he was a, an advocate. And so he didn't want us to overuse our blackness and make it a victim. So he taught me how not to be a victim. You can't be both a leader and a victim. Pick a team. Mm. Um, and, and then I think he, he, the biggest thing he did for me was he introduced me to God the day I was born. He introduced me to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And not that I always follow the law. I cuss a little bit. I get mad. I have a temper. Um, but uh, he let me know there's always somewhere to go. When things aren't working out right, there's always somewhere to go. And then just compassion and the give back. And I saw him give, so it made me give. And, um, and, and then when you leave and you find out that people don't have that, it actually breaks your heart because you, I want every woman to have experienced a great black dad. You know, I think we all deserve that. And I think when black men realize that that is their place to give that to the women in their life and the boys in their life, to give them their greatness, because black men have the capacity to give us greatness. People, there, there's, I love data because it's just like the facts, but there's data that shows that when a um, black man goes to church, his entire, there's an 80% chance his entire family is going to follow him. When a black woman goes to church, it's like less than 50%, right? So that tells you your power right there to bring an entire family. Now, sometimes y'all might bring, bring in two families to do different churches. I'm not going to touch that part of it, but. What I just say is that uh, I think black men have a place that is so needed in this world. And that's what I just hope that other people will give. But that's what my dad gave me. 
certainly. There, there was a uh, a recent article in the Call to Crisis, okay. and it spoke about black women feeling unprotected by black men. Uh, do you feel that's a thing? Have you heard about that? And if so, do you have anything to say to that? Can you say that again? Gordon was yeah. talking to me in the background. Absolutely, absolutely. Tell which I said what's up. Yeah. Uh, but no, there was a recent article written in, in the Call to Action or Call to Crisis. I'm sorry. And it spoke about how black women don't feel protected by black men. I was wondering if, generally speaking, right, if you think that is a thing where there's a lack of protection now. And, and with the Breonna Taylor cases, and even when we see police brutality or other transgressions, um, we are quicker to call them out against black men. The voices are louder for black men than they are for black women, typically. I was wondering if you have anything to speak to um, on that. And I, and I got so, a and I got. I'm sorry. And I got one thing to add on to that. How can we, as, as black men, myself, Gerard, you know, in our roles, how can we empower black women in workplaces? How can we empower black women in our lives? You know, of course, I have my ideas. I'm sure Gerard has his as well. But how do, how can we continue to empower black women? Um. So I'll answer the first question. Was your question was Gerard? Um, uh, Lack of, that, yeah, uh, there's a lack of protection from black men. Uh, yeah, um, it just depends on the black man. I think that okay. if someone was actually doing something to me and a black man walked past, he would stop and help me. Mm -hmm. I just think he would, right? Um, do, do you guys hurt us? Absolutely. In relationships, can they be awful? Absolutely. So there, it just depends on what context. But I'll say this. Um, there is a, a guy named Dr. Uh, Marx. And he does bias training, and he has a lot of data about bias training. And he actually, when he starts off, he has you uh, say what you think when you hear a black man. And you all put in what you think. And on the screen, whatever people think the most, the word is larger, right? And it all comes with thug. I've been to his session a couple times. Thug is always the largest. Athlete is among the top. Criminal is among the top. Um, mental illness is in there, and it just goes on and on, right? So if you have a society who looks at you like that and who actually accuses you of not protecting Black women, what do you think you're going to become? Not a protector for sure. Not a protector for sure. So I'll never say something bad collectively about all black men, but this is what I say. You all know who you are, right? And you know whether you will protect or not, and I'm going to believe you will. For sure. Uh, that's Mo's question. What was your Mo? Um, how, how, how can uh, we, as, as African-American men, empower our black women? So you guys, I want you to know, I keep getting a lot of text messages saying they couldn't get into Zoom. I didn't know if you knew that. Um, I don't know if you have people in Zoom. I do. But I, okay. I have people texting me saying they couldn't get in the Zoom. So as long as you got it. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, Say that yeah. again. How, how, can, how can we as African-American men empower um, black women in our workplaces, um, in our lives? How, how can we empower uh, uh, black women? So first of all, we're not all the same. No. We all need something a little different. So of that's course. get to know us, mm -hmm. right? and understand what we want and just have a conversation with us and when you're with other people it's okay to still talk to us right you know what i'm saying so especially depending on what position you're in and um be a sounding board right be a sounding board and sometimes you have to open that relationship up and actually say you know what can i do there's a guy who used to always say hey sis that right there always made me feel comfortable and when I did have a problem, I was able to just give him a call. And only thing he said to me all the time was, hey, sis. And that was it. So it's just like having that welcoming um, presence. And I think that in itself opens the door to help us. And then when we're not there, it's more important what you do to people when they're not around and what you do when you think no one is looking. And only you can, you know, handle that. But do the right thing no matter if we're sitting there or we're not. Thank you. I got to get to the to the Black Lives Matter mural. I, I, I need to, I have questions, right? Okay. 
So let's start with the work that it took you from, from word on the street has it that you got that going within 24 to 48 hours. Is that accurate? Like, was you able to mobilize that quick? No. So Thursday, it was a Thursday when I think I went to the March. It was a Wednesday or Thursday for the black firemen. Um, and I was standing in front of, um, we started at city hall and I was standing there thinking, this is where decisions get made. We put these people in here, right? And I just kept thinking when my son takes off that fire uniform, he's a black man. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted Black Lives Matter right there. So that was the first thing. Then we walked down the with street. With the explanation point. With the, yeah, that was, that was it. So um, probably two days before that, people kept texting me saying, what can we do? What do you want? And that's when I wrote the poem. And it started off with, I want what you want, mm -hmm. right? Nothing more, nothing less. And as I, I was like, oh, that's really about what we want. So I knew that was the story I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. So I text, I actually got online that Thursday night or Wednesday, I think it was Thursday. And I said, does anyone know how to get the Black Lives Matter mural up? And um, Tamaya, I think, you know, who used to be councilwoman, she I actually said, hey, you know how to get it, just call City Hall. And I know the mayor. Um, I sit on a couple things with the mayor and I know Greg Lansman, but I know Greg oh. always answers his email. So you have to know like who, which council member actually answers emails really quick versus who might take a week. Mm -hmm. So I sent them an email that says, I want to put Black Lives Matter on there. I need, what do I need to do? And um, they came back and said, you think you could do it for Juneteenth? And that was that next Friday. Well, I knew they were, I knew they expected me to say, that might be a little difficult. And they sent me that on Friday. On Saturday, I sent a note and said, absolutely. I just need to go. And then Greg was like, that's next Friday. I said, absolutely. I just need the yes. So on Sunday, they sent me a, he sent me a note and said, you go make it happen. I'll handle the paperwork, getting approval. And so I immediately, First of all, I, I use social media because I immediately said it was going to happen because now they have to make it happen, right? Then I, I text a couple people trying to find artists. I had asked about artists that Thursday too. So mm -hmm. someone gave me a list of artists. I called Artswave too. They were going to give me a list that Monday morning. And I got on a Zoom call at three o'clock on that Sunday with maybe 12 artists. I told them my vision and I told them that I was going to be on a call the next day with Artsway and they all agreed to lead one of the letters. I told them my poem. We decided that very minute who the project manager was going to be on site. Um, I called one of my friends and said, Hey, I need an assistant to help me. And she was like, no, you don't. I got you. I'm going to come help. <laughs> there you go. And so that was on Sunday. All that happened on Sunday. And then Monday morning, I had a call with Artswave and, and on a Zoom, and it was like 10 white artists. And I said, I appreciate you, but none of you guys can be a lead artist on this because I need all black artists to lead a letter because it's about our story, right? And you can help, you know, and I need your money. So I looked at how much it was going to cost, and I said, I need artists to get paid. I need them to get paid a lot of money. You know what I'm saying? I want them to go fast. So uh, I opened the GoFundMe and the rest, I raised like $150,000 in a couple of days. And um, we started Wednesday at seven and was done Friday at one. So they had to have their designs in by uh, Wednesday morning so that the, uh, I needed the city to say yes. So I'll say we started on Sunday at three is when I first met them. That first day on Wednesday, I had them all wear red shirts so we knew each other. Because we didn't know, I had never met them. Mm -hmm. I had never met any of the artists. Um, so I don't, I, it's, it wasn't 24 hours. They painted it in 20 hours, though. That's amazing. The fact that you was able to get that accomplished in a week, less than a week is, is amazing within itself. I'm impressed. I, I, every time I hear you speak, uh, I'm more so, I'm galvanized. That's the word. I'm galvanized. 
this is a woman who just said, you know, I, I told 12 artists, they, they came on the phone with 10 artists, excuse me. They were all white. You can't lead this, but we do need your money. How was that? How was that conversation? Were they open to that? Were they receptive to that? It, well, I I did explain. I mean, it wasn't that blunt. It was a quick yeah. call, though. But yeah. um, <laughs> it was quick. It was quick. Let but, me but, but. let me say it like this: Is that uh, first of all, um, Alicia? She's the CEO. I had talked to her on Sunday when it first all happened, and she understood that I needed help in artists. She I didn't tell her at the time. I just needed black artists. And I always look to see, you know, she's an organization about arts. They have a lot of money. Um, and I needed her to understand our truth. And when you're an ally, you'll do that. And what I remind people is that the women's movement, the suffrage in New York City that happened, they didn't invite any black women. But the one black person who was there who helped them was Frederick Douglass. And he wasn't going to use exercise his right to vote until women had their right to vote. And black women weren't even included. They needed him as an ally. And so we need allies. And so when people open their door like that, like, like Alicia did for Arts Wave, I knew she wanted to be an ally. And so when I said it, I said it in a way that allowed them to understand, this is about us. And we want you to ride with us, right? We just need to drive the car because we know where we're going. We also know where we've been. It, it, it's like I go back to saying, um, you know, white women with black babies, I get it, right? But you, my experience, you can't manufacture that. And so I think when we're honest with people, especially our allies, and we let them know we do need you, we do appreciate you, we have to change this together, right? I think they respect that. People respect the truth. We just don't know how to tell it. So I just try to be truthful and um, forthright in my conversation. So that's it. And you know, I say a little prayer. God is God. I prayed. We prayed every morning before they painted. As soon as I met them on the phone, you know, I asked God to direct us. I asked God to make sure none of us got COVID, and we didn't. You know, thank God for that. I had everyone go get tested that Wednesday after we finished. Uh, we did social distancing, and that's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, and so um. We just, I think God was a part of this. So I can't say I did it alone because I didn't, you know, but I think so many times people worry about the uh, criticizers, right? The people are going to criticize. And when you're going to have courage, you have to do things that you know going to pick people off sometimes and just keep going. Because not everyone was happy. Some of the notes I had, my husband came down with his little, he's a, uh, he's a, a gun coating kind of, toting kind of man, you know. He has his license, so he came down and had to sit down there because, you know, we had a little bit of, uh, you know, some little stuff that happened. But um, God always handles things. Speaking of, speaking of stuff that happened, um, as, as we know, and I think it was last week, um, there was a, an individual who was yet to be um, caught um, throw red paint on the mural. Mm -hmm. Share your reaction to that. Um, I, I know, I know what you know, my reaction. I'm sure Gerard, but please share your reaction. Um, so I actually uh, got the email, and no one knew about it when I got the email. And I um, got in my car, drove down there. Think it was still daylight. I didn't want to tell any of the artists until I really saw it for myself. So this happened at when night, I, though, correct? No. It, well, when I found out about it, it was in the next. I day. found out about it. It probably had happened the night before. Okay. I found okay. out about it about four o'clock that day. Okay. And I drove down there and it was a couple down there, a white couple down there. And um, they were like, hey, don't you love this? And I was like, yeah, it's pretty cool. I just came down I heard someone threw some paint on it. So the guy walks over and he explains to me, he knew what he was talking about. He was like, oh, they dumped it. And then people have driven through it. Right, because I was trying to figure out was this on purpose? Is something melting? I didn't, you know, I really wanted to make sure I knew. And as he was explaining, all of a sudden, all these cars came up to block it from one of the protest groups, right? And they jumped out and, you know, was protesting about it. And I told him, you know what, we did this all in love. And you, you can't actually change our story or what we desire with some red paint. Mm -hmm. You just can't. You, you can't do it. So um, 
I wouldn't do any interviews because I actually said that we're not fixing it until we figure out how to close it down. And actually I was on with the city earlier today. Um, and so we're not gonna fix it because people will just keep doing it. And it's okay because what we know is that now we have emotions open. And when people open up their emotions, they don't know it, but that's the time when you change hearts. That's the time when people really are like ready to listen sometimes. And some people just are gonna just give hate, but um, it, it did not bother me like people thought it bothered me. It didn't. Um, and the letter that they actually put the S on, it just meant even more to me because it was the S and the S had the statue, the black statue of Liberty that um, is debated, but um, some historians say that that's what um, he had actually rendered in the beginning. And then people had told him the U.S. would never accept that black Statue of Liberty, which is when he switched to the white Statue of Liberty, but put the handcuff, the cuffs at the bottom of her, her feet. Um, that to me was even more telling. Mm -hmm. And then you knew the person who did it actually did it, um, knowing where the cameras were. So they had thought about it and tried to dump it really quick. So it was just all, it, it's where we are. It's just reflective of who we are and where we are. So it wasn't, it didn't hurt my feelings or make it, it didn't do any of that to me. It's just where we are. Are you where in charge? Where we are. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Really quickly. What, what do you, where we are? Can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean when you say that? Yeah, without getting political. So of course, of course, of course. it's always been where it's always the feelings that people have has been there. Here in Cincinnati. Now, oh, okay. So this is Cincinnati. Okay. We're segregated, right? We're nicely segregated and we're nice people. On the surface, we speak, we're nice, and that's who we are. But on the inside, we got a whole lot of mess going on. On the inside, what we've seen is, you know, we went through our police brutality years ago, and the collaborative agreement has said you cannot put your knee on people's necks, and there was a lot of things that we had to do just to get through that, right? We know that we have people that do not have our best interests at heart, we know that we have a high, high rate of unemployment for Blacks, our underemployment, and we, we know we have problems. There was in 2015, um, the Urban League actually put out the state of two, the state of two, black, two cities, yep. right? Yep. And it actually gives you the data that shows we die at a higher rate, just one mile from each other. So let's not, let's not pretend like we don't know who we are because we do yeah. but what was the fact was is that we are it was hidden and we were nice about it and we pretended over the last couple years people have gotten bold with it so where we are is people don't hide it like they used to right mm -hmm. it's not as much in the shadows but when things come out then we're able to really fight against it it's harder to fight against something that people pretend isn't true, right? But now I think truth is on our side. So that's what I mean by it's where we are. And some people are upset that the truth is out and they're trying to actually hide it again. So they tried to hide it with red paint mm -hmm. and it's not something you can hide. I appreciate you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Gerard. Are you, I'm assuming that you're encouraged by the conversations and the outpour, um, of people who want to listen and want to to understand um, Black Lives Mattering, right, so to speak, with it being sustainable or figuring out how we can sustain it, what, what recommendation do you have just to the youth, right, from a, a, a woman who, who's grown and seen a lot, right? What recommendation do you have to Maurice, myself, about just getting out there or finding the outlets to reach back and get people and just anyone on our platform? Yeah, I think you're doing it. I think you guys are doing it. First Thank of you. all, um, I'm proud of what you're doing. Um, I'm excited by what you're doing. It says a lot that you want to have the conversations and you want to um, engage in the marches. I, um, I have this thing that if everyone sat down and thought to themselves, what am I going to say to my children and grandchildren when they say, what part did you play in the 2020 civil rights movement? Mm -hmm. And what does that conversation look like, right? And if you really think about that, whether you're white or black, what are you going to tell your children and their children, the role you play at this particular time? 
right? Doesn't come around all the time. So that's one thing that I would ask everyone to ask themselves. And if you're not playing a role and the only thing you're doing is hating on social media, get some business about yourself and let's get to work because it's a lot of work to do and we don't have time to criticize each other. Let's Certainly. just make each other better, Certainly. right? Certainly. The other thing I say for the young kids is we have to reach back and we have to sow goodness in their life. There is no such thing as black on black crime. I just want people to know that. There is crime. White people kill white people. Black people kill black people. It's all about your location. If you look at data, it'll show you that it's about the same 80 to 83% white on white and black on black, right? Now, that's one thing. But if you don't feel good about yourself, and you keep looking at somebody who look like you, it's like looking in the mirror. What you gonna do? You fighting each other, right? So we have to somehow teach our kids to see the beauty that we know exists in, in them. Our black churches should be full. They should be full, right? And whether you believe in God or not, what you should believe in is something bigger than you. And teach your kids there's something bigger than you. And we should all know the only person that we're better than is us ourselves from the day before. I'm better than Alandis yesterday. That's the only person I'm better than. And if I teach my kids that, and if I teach them to give and you'll get, it is, it is a rule. When you give to people, you'll get back. And if we just teach that to each other, and if you teach that, if you see kids acting up, you're supposed to actually stop them. You're supposed to stop them. That's what we used to do. Our neighbor, my neighbor used to jack me up. You know, we don't do that anymore, right? And I don't mean put your hands on them, don't say Atlanta six, start hitting people's, other people's kids. Right. But you actually should have a conversation, a conversation, an education. Um, I talked to a guy the other day, he's a billionaire. And I was asking him, why is he in the, to the schools? He's built a couple schools in, in um, South Carolina and a couple other places asked him what made him do that. And he said, because every dollar spent on education actually helps to combat drugs, um, incarceration. It does so much. So, so we have to understand the power of education too. Certainly. We have to. Yeah. So those are the things I think we have to do for young kids. Certainly. Certainly. I got time for one more question, Mo. It's, it's 69. Alandis, I, I need one more thing from you. Um, I have a, a sneaky suspicion that you've never had a hard time finding your voice, and I could be wrong, but I feel like you've always known your voice. Do you have any recommendations for Black women uh, in particular, how to, to empower them to find their voice as a leader? Have there, has there ever been conversations that you had? Anything that you can give us in regards to helping Black women find their voices? And um, can I add one more thing on the back end of that? The poem. Can we hear the poem? Oh, you think I remember it? Let's see. <laughs> you got to hear the poem. You got to hear okay. the poem. I, I, mean, I got the video, watching. but I'm like, no, I won't. We want to hear it because I think we got some exclusivity right now. <laughs> okay. I actually have to find it because I don't have it memorized. Is that terrible? No. No, it's not uh, terrible. You know how many things I write that I don't remember? You're like, good. I yeah, no, and um, what people don't realize is that I've always loved poetry, and this was the first poem I actually allowed for other people to know about or to read or anything. Okay. I've never done that because I've never, you know, how you just don't feel comfortable with yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you actually want me to say it? I want you to Excellent. say it. Yes. Okay. This is exclusive. This is exclusive. Yeah, that's a, that's it. We'll see. Okay. We All right, we why? want Okay. We want what you want to raise our kids in peace. We want what you want to provide for our families. We want what you want to live free from unjust persecution. We want what you want to be treated equally, fair, and just. We want what you want for rules that oppress people like us to be lifted. We want what you want, for systems designed to negatively impact our families to be eradicated. We want what you want, 
to truly see this as a land of opportunity. We want what you want to witness our children grow into adults. We want what you want to play with our grandchildren and celebrate as they graduate from high school and college. We want what you want to walk in a place of education and know it is truly used to educate. We want what you want for others to see the males in our lives as gentlemen with kind hearts and not as thugs and criminals. We want what you want to see the ladies who look like us as beautiful and deserving of equal rights, just like the ladies in your life. We want what you want, equal pay, equal opportunity, and to know that you desire our presence at your professional table and not just tolerate it. We want what you want, to know that the people carrying the gun has a desire to protect and not to kill. We want what you want, to know that your voice will speak against the wrongs and support the rights. We want what you want, a place that our art of blackness will be safe at it, as it hangs in your space. We want what you want, nothing more, nothing less. That, that has to be the theme poem for the year. That, that's amazing. That is amazing. Thank you. Um, Thanks. We appreciate you, Alanis. We, we definitely appreciate you. Um, I still want to, to end it with this. Just any words of encouragement. Let's just, we're going to let you lead us on out of here. Any words mm. of encouragement for the people? Oh, woman. Yeah. yeah. Hey, give people grace. You'll get it back. Operate with peace. You'll love it. And we all need a little mercy because we all make mistakes every day of our life. But we got this. Together, we can make it. We can make a change. I think we can. We appreciate you. Alanis Powell, thank you so much for joining us on the discussion today. Yes. All right. Take care. Thanks thank for having me. Thank you all. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Absolutely.